I'm going to invite you to have a seat and take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 14 is where we're going to be this morning. Matthew 14 is our text. We're continuing our, our Heroes series. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 975 and you will find Matthew chapter 14. And you can join with us in reading the text and taking a look at it up close. Hey, there is a lot going on, and I'm excited that in the middle of summer, when it's a billion degrees outside, life is still happening here at Calvary. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but uh, we've got about 48 high schoolers leaving for camp this morning. They're meeting right about now over at McCulloch Campus, gearing up to go to, to NAU for the week at Zona Camp, and I and just invite you to pray for life change. we got a group of 5th and 6th graders coming back from camp today, and they've had a great experience. Uh, and uh, there's just stuff going on. Tomorrow morning, and you already heard about this on the, on the video, uh, we are uh, having a painting project at Thunderbolt Middle School. We've committed to paint 40 classrooms there, and if you'd like to help, we would love to have you come and help. Whether you like to tape, or whether you like to paint, or whether you like to bake cookies and watch people eat them, we don't care. Uh, just come and be a part. If you want to help, go to our website, calvarylc.com, sign up to help, or you can just show up, because we'll let you help. If you want to work, we'll let you work. And, and this is just a way that we show our community, that we love our community, that, that Jesus makes a difference and we want to make it better and, and that's what they need. So uh, I hope you can be a part of that. Also, something I'm excited about that's coming up, uh, not like immediately soon, but uh, we're taking a trip to the Holy Land. We're going to be going to Israel in uh, November. And if you are interested in going, we, it's not too late. The deadline to sign up is August the first we've got a meeting happening on july 29th so if that's something that you're interested in then contact me let me know show up at the meeting uh, we'd love to include you there's nothing that brings the bible alive quite in that way of seeing the places that scripture talks about and, and and just imagining what it was like in the days that jesus was there so it's something we're excited about i'm excited about anyway and maybe you are too Hey, we're in Matthew 14, and we're in our hero series where we've been talking about heroes of the faith and how every one of us can be a hero of faith. And today uh, we're looking at uh, the story that is found in Matthew chapter 14. It's one of the most dramatic, exciting, incredible events recorded in the Gospels. This is the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. So let's look at the text, Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Before we read it, though, let me tell you what's just happened on this day. Because this is a crazy day in the life of Jesus' ministry. First of all, he gets word that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been executed. John was a prisoner of King Herod, and, and he was in, in jail because he, he's a prophet, and he told Herod that what he was doing was wrong, that he was uh, committing adultery, and so he got locked up, and then kind of out of uh, uh, obligation, uh, Herod had him executed, beheaded. And Jesus found out that his cousin, the guy who was the prophet who came before the Messiah, uh, had lost his life and he was grieving. And so he and the disciples went across the Sea of Galilee to the eastern side and the crowds followed him. And so he got there. He was trying to hope to get away and be alone for a little bit. And instead he ended up preaching and teaching and healing. And, and then at the end of the day, he performed a huge miracle. He fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and fish. And then we come to the text for today. It starts off with immediately. It was immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. It says this. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, Jesus was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And, then the, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, 
And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I mean, this is an amazing miracle. And our hero this week, Peter, uh, participated in an incredible way. But before we talk about Peter and what he did walking on water, let's talk about the men in the boat. The men in the boat. Because there were 12 men in this boat, 12 disciples, uh, and they were in the boat. What do we know about them? Let's think about it. First of all, they were followers of Jesus. The 12 men in the boat were followers of Jesus. Okay, one of them was a fake. Okay, Judas was in the boat. He was the betrayer. Uh, maybe he wasn't a follower, but the rest of them, they were followers of Jesus. They had seen the miracles. They just participated in that miracle lunch. They believed in Jesus and what he was doing. So before going any further, are you in the boat? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life. You see, if you haven't yet done that, if you haven't made that commitment to follow Jesus, then you might be hanging out near the boat. You might be hanging out with boat people. Got lots of those in Havasu, but we're talking about a different kind. You know, but, but you've got to actually get in the boat. You actually, actually believe in Jesus, become a follower of Jesus. And, and if you haven't done that, nothing else I say really matters today because the most important decision that you can make in your life is to get in the boat, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the men in the boat were followers of Jesus, and they were obedient to Jesus. They were obedient to Jesus. Jesus sent them to the other side of the lake without him. And the story tells us they were rowing to the other side of the lake against the wind. They did what Jesus directed them to do, even though it didn't make any sense to them. Can you imagine the conversation uh, Jesus, you want us to get in the boat? Yes. You want us to leave you here and row to the other side? Yes. Jesus, how are you going to get to the other side? <laughs> Jesus, wouldn't it be better if we just went, hung out here and waited for you? You know, we'll start a fire, roast some marshmallows, do whatever. And, 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 you know, why are you telling us? They have all these questions, but in the end, they actually got in the boat and they rowed toward the other side. They were obedient to Jesus. So they obeyed and they struggled. They were struggling. Scripture tells us that the wind was blowing against them and the waves made it difficult. Now, they weren't in danger like uh, in the miracle when Jesus calmed the wind and the waves, but they were in difficulty. Which means that we can be obedient followers of Jesus and expect to struggle. Expect to struggle. Nowhere... Does God promise us that if we become followers of Jesus, if we obey Jesus, that all of our problems are going to disappear and, and everything's just going to be sunshine and roses? He doesn't promise that. In fact, God promises lots of things, but not that. He promises to be with us always, to help us, to defend us, to fight for us, to provide for us, to bless us. He promises to prepare a place for us. It's called heaven, and one day we won't care about the problems we have now. But in this world, Jesus said, you will have struggles. He said this to his, to his followers. He said, look, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. And I share this because uh, a lot of us live with guilt in our lives. And it goes something like this. Well, I'm struggling, so I must have done something wrong. I must be in sin. God must be angry at me. This must be discipline. So God's punishing me. But in the story, we have followers of Jesus who are being obedient, and they were struggling, which means it's possible that if you're struggling, you're exactly where God wants you to be. See, God doesn't travel in guilt. He travels in conviction. The Holy Spirit is in you if you're a follower of Christ. And the voice of the Holy Spirit is going to point out your sin. And when we repent of it, when we turn away from it, uh, and we ask for forgiveness, then he, he doesn't bring it up anymore. That guilt voice, that's not from God. Conviction is from God. Recognize it, respond to it, and you get grace and peace. Guilt, that's another source. But it's not God. So understand, these guys were 
obedient followers of Jesus who were struggling and they were afraid. They were afraid. You know, they saw Jesus walking on the water and they thought he was a ghost. And they freaked out. And we probably would have freaked out too. And then Jesus says what he seems to always say, or God always says, when, when we're afraid. Don't be afraid. It's me. Don't be afraid. It's I. I mean, think about it. You just read Scripture, and you, all throughout Scripture, God shows up and tells people not to be afraid because it's always awe-inspiring and terrifying when God shows up. And maybe you've had some really spiritual experiences in your life where they kind of overwhelmed you. I mean, we're just singing the song about, you know, overwhelm us, God. And, and it's like, really? Because that can be pretty terrifying. To be in the presence of the holy God, knowing that we are sinners, knowing that, that we fail, and, and, and when God starts demonstrating his power in our lives and in a, the lives around us, it can take our breath away. It can knock the, the, the wind right out of us. It can be a little bit scary. The disciples were shocked, surprised, scared. Which brings us to that heroic moment. We're not looking at Peter's whole life. We're looking at this one moment when he did something that nobody else did. So let's talk about the man who left the boat. The man who got out of the boat. Because there's only two men in recorded history that have walked on water. Jesus and Peter. Well, Jesus, he's kind of special. But Peter, he's our hero of faith that we can relate to. Now think about this. In the boat were 12 obedient followers of Jesus. 11 of those men in the boat would go on to become apostles Leaders in the early church, performers of miracles, writers of scripture. These guys had it together, if you will. But only one got out of the boat. So I want us to look at Peter's moment of heroic faith. And I want us to kind of to ask some questions about our own life and our own faith and see where that leads us. So first thing we see, Peter's faith walk, is the request. Verse 28 it says, and Peter answered Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, first of all, Peter wanted some validation. Jesus, if that's really you. And I know a lot of times in our prayer life, we kind of feel like God's leading us someplace, but, but we're kind of like, God, is this really you? God, are you the one telling me this? God, or, you know, we want to know, and it's okay to ask, God, if that's really you. But then he says this, he asked Jesus for an invitation. If it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter alone makes this crazy faith request of Jesus. Now, wouldn't you think that the other 11 guys in the boat, when Peter said, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water, somebody, one of them would have said, me too. I want to do that. But nobody said anything. They were silent. They were watching it. So what are you requesting from God? What are you requesting from God? Because Peter made this crazy faith request. Are you asking God for things that increase your faith or challenge your faith? Or are you requesting things from God that will actually decrease your reliance on him? Actually decrease your faith. So if we pray for more money, you know, want the windfall, you know, want the inheritance, want to win the lottery. Are we asking for more money so that we can depend on God more or less? When we pray for healing, whether it's for us or for a loved one, we're asking God to take the pain away, make them healthy again, make us strong, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. Is that healing going to draw us closer to God or actually depend on Him less? You see, think about the things that actually draw you to Jesus. A lot of times it's the pain, it's the struggle, it's the need that brings us before God saying, I need you. I realized when I was writing this that not all of my prayers are for more faith. Uh, I'll just confess that to you. Since we got into the Sweetwater campus uh, a little over a year ago, I've had two prayers that uh, every time I see the building, I, I kind of voice to God. The first one uh, is for God to fill this place up to overflowing. And, and, uh, and he's been doing that. But my prayer is that God would lead so many people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus that we don't have room for us all, and we have to figure out what to do next. 
That's a prayer that requires more faith because with more people, there's more responsibility. We've got to have more life groups. We've got to have more, you know, counselors. We've got to have more uh, pastoral care. We've got to do all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's more responsibility. It's more faith, and I'm going to rely on God more. That's a, that, that's a more faith prayer. My other prayer, not so much. My other prayer is this, God, pay the building off. Okay? Uh, you know, uh, just honest. I want God to provide the, the resources to pay the building off so we don't have any debt because I want to use that money that we're using for debt for ministry so it can impact more lives. Okay, it's an honorable reason, but I also realize this. If, if God miraculously paid the building off, wouldn't be praying about finances nearly as much. There wouldn't be nearly as much need. Not saying I'm going to stop praying that, but I'm just pointing out that sometimes our prayers tell us whether we want to get out of the boat or whether we want to play it safe. What we request from God tells us a lot about where our heart is. So first we see Peter's request, and then we see the step. Verse 29 simply says, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. He took the step of faith. Faith heroes are always willing to get out of the boat. And this is never easy. Okay, it's always risky. It's always frightening. In fact, logic argues against that step of faith. Tells us not to do it. Tells us it's too dangerous. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Don't do it. Our friends, a lot of times, people around us, warn us against taking a step of faith. They say things like, that's crazy. Don't do it. What are you thinking? But... Faith heroes get out of the boat. The only way that Peter can participate in this crazy miracle is if he gets out of the boat. And so Jesus said, get out of the boat. And Peter took the step of faith. So what are you risking for God? What are you risking for God? Because faith heroes don't play it safe. And I realize when I say that... that Faith heroes don't play it safe. That challenges our safety first society. Because we live in a culture that over the last 40 or 50 years has made safety an idol. Now, they've done some good things, but they take it way too far. For instance, car seats. Great idea for little ones. Put little ones in the car seat. They're much safer than, say, their mom's laps. Right? Because a lot of us came home in our mom's laps. Right? Right? And, and the car seat's a great idea for little ones, but, you know, the safety Nazis want to take it too far. They want to, you to be in a car seat until you're like 33. And, uh, you know, you've got to weigh 400 pounds before you get out of a car seat. And, uh, and all these rules. And it's like, hey, you're taking that a little too far. But it doesn't stop there, you know. Putting, putting kind of age-appropriate labels on children's toys, great idea. Kind of so you don't buy the wrong toy for the wrong age. That helps a whole lot. But then they go too far, right? Have you bought a Happy Meal any time in your life? Nowadays, the little plastic bag that the toy comes in for the Happy Meal, you know what it says on that bag? This bag is not a toy. (laughs) Really? This bag is not a toy. Like the toddler playing with it can read that and go, i got to put this down. It's not a toy. And if you're a parent and you have to be told that this bag is not a toy, you should not have children. (laughs) All right? It's, It's a little crazy. A few years ago, you know, McDonald's made the news because a person got, you know, scalded with their hot coffee. And there was all that, you know, concern about the the temperature of the coffee. And I loved it because I walked into Jack in the Box early after that. And and they had on their coffee cups, caution, hot coffee is hot. (laughs) And I went, yes, thank you. And then I think their lawyers made him take it off because it wasn't there anymore. We're kind of, a you know, safety crazy. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but some of my friends back east have been, like, emailing me saying, are you guys okay? Because we hear how hot it is there. Go on the Weather Channel, it's got excessive heat warning. I'm like, is that really necessary for Havasu? <laughs> I mean, come on, it's hot here from, like, May to September. We kind of are aware that it's going to be hot. If it's not hot, it's, something's wrong with the world. And they're telling us, oh, be careful, it's hot. Really? Okay, thanks for that. Heads up. You see, safety's become one of our idols. But Jesus doesn't call us to be safe. Jesus calls us to follow him. To trust him. To follow him unflinchingly out of the boat. To follow him out of the boat without... a. OSHA approves life preserver. (laughs) 
And the question is, what are we risking for God? Because here's what I see. I see people living frustrated lives that are imprisoned by their routine, that are driven by their ruts, and they end up being bored, and so they look for excitement in stupid and destructive places. And we ask God to change our lives, and then we refuse to follow where Jesus leads because it's too risky. The truth is, if you want excitement in your life, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus because he will lead you to joy. You will start seeing life change happen in your life and the life of those around you. And you can celebrate that. And you start feeling that sense of purpose. And life grows. And it's not boring. It's not dull. It's, it's not just imprisoned by a routine. It is set alive by the one who gives us life. But to do that, you've got to be willing to take the risk. You've got to stop playing it safe. You've got to get out of the boat. You've got to take the step of faith. Now, after encouraging you to step out of the boat, the next thing we see from our hero Peter is that he's sinking. Yeah, I know. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Verse 30. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. So Peter gets out of the boat, he's walking on the water, and then he begins to sink. Why did he start to sink? He was afraid. He was afraid. One moment he is acting in God's miraculous power, the next he's crying like a little girl. That's what he's doing. And, and, and reading this, you kind of go, are you serious, Peter? And then I thank God that Peter's story is in Scripture. He's a real example that I can relate to because I'm like Peter. One moment I'm walking in faith, I'm celebrating God's power. I think I can conquer anything. And the next moment I'm afraid and failing and crying like a little girl. So a couple of observations out of that. First is even amazing faith leaders struggle and fail. We sink. Doesn't matter what level of faith you're at. Just understand that's part of it. Peter did it, we're going to do it. Second observation is this. Peter failed because he focused on the problems and not on Jesus. He focused on the problems, not on Jesus. He saw the wind and he was afraid. I got news for you. The wind was there before Peter got out of the boat. Right? Jesus sent him on ahead and they're in the boat and they're struggling because the wind is against them. The wind has been there the whole time. The waves have been there the whole time. Peter sees Jesus. He says, if it's you, tell me to come out of the boat. He gets out of the boat, and, and he walks to Jesus. The wind has not changed at all. But suddenly, Peter focuses on the problem. He focuses on the wind, not on Jesus. And he starts to sink. Nothing changed except Peter's focus. So today, where is your focus? Where is your focus? Your problems are absolutely real. Your struggles are real. The adversity that you're facing, it's real. Jesus is real. Where's your focus? If you focus on the problems, on your struggles, on your failures, on your pain, on the adversity, then you're going to live a negative, cynical, complaining, fearful, angry life. If you focus on Jesus, if you focus on his power to redeem, if you focus on the blessings that God has poured out on your life, if you focus on God's grace and love for you, you will live thankful, joyful, encouraging lives. So where is your focus? Let me take it home just to uh, get really personal. In your marriage, where is your focus? Because when you're married, that other person... They're always there. They're always there. And so you see them up close. You see their flaws. You see those annoying habits. You, you see how they're selfish and all the things they do wrong and how they're not the person that you thought they were supposed to be when you said, I do. And it's so easy to get angry and bitter and let that destroy your relationship. If your focus is on all the problems. 
On the other hand, if your focus is on Jesus, what happens is when you hang out with Jesus, he kind of points out your flaws and your annoying habits and all the ways that you're selfish and that you fail. And then he starts talking to you about how you can love your spouse better because they deserve it. And how you can be less selfish. And suddenly the dynamic of your relationship change and you become thankful. You're thankful for the grace that God gives you because you're a sinner and, and you need that grace. And you're thankful that your spouse would live with you. Where's your focus? Because when we focus on problems, we sink. And when we focus on Jesus, well, we see miracles happen in our life. Peter took his focus off Jesus. He started sinking. And then, in the midst of his failure, he reacted in the best way possible because he cried out, Lord, save me! Now, that's a model prayer that we can use. Right? Every one of us has prayed that at some time in our life, whether we want to admit it or not. It's not nearly as fancy as the one Jesus taught, but uh, it works. So Peter cries out, Lord, save me, and we see the rescue. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of Peter, saying to him, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? So Jesus saves. And in this case, he saved physically. And then Jesus asked Peter the hardest question. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Now, I'm kind of disappointed because Scripture does not record Peter's response. So let me just ask you, why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? I, I mean, most of us are in the boat following Jesus, trying to be obedient to him. You might be a leader. You might want to be a leader. Jesus might want you to be a leader. And today, Jesus is inviting you to take a risk, to step out of the boat, to follow him. And the question is, will you or will you doubt? For some, stepping out of the boat may mean confessing Jesus publicly in baptism. I mean, you know you're in the boat. You know you're a follower of Jesus. Jesus has changed your life. You just have never gotten around to professing your faith in the biblical way that Jesus asked us to, which is getting into, I'm pointing over here because the baptistry is over here in case you're new, and, and getting into the water of baptism and telling the people that you're an unashamed follower of Jesus. And, and some of you have got all the excuses. Well, I don't like water. I kind of get nervous in front of people. Uh, I don't want to get my hair wet, whatever it is. It, you know, here's the thing. Nobody wants to actually get over here because they're all nervous and they're all kind of afraid of what they're going to look like on the camera and stuff. But the question is, will you get out of the boat? Will you follow Jesus? For some of you, it's just simply admitting that you've got a problem that you can't conquer and showing up at Celebrate Recovery tomorrow night at the McCulloch campus at 6.30. See? They've done it. They've had Jesus show up in their life in a mir miraculous way. And, and, and he can do that in your life, but you've got to actually say, hey, I've got this problem I can't handle. For some of you, getting out of the boat means forgiving somebody who has ruined your life. For some of you, it's asking someone to forgive you whose life you ruined. For some of you, getting out of the boat may mean just simply saying, hey, I want to serve God. Getting out of the boat means getting off your butt. Showing up, doing something, helping out, being a servant. For some of you, stepping out of the boat means committing to your marriage. For some, it means getting married. For some, getting out of the boat may mean deciding to lead a ministry. You know, more people, more leaders. That's what we need. More life groups. For some of you, it may mean, you know, beginning a ministry that we don't have. And some of you need to get real with God because he's wanting you to be a pastor or a missionary. For some, getting out of the boat simply means tithing. Your spiritual life is stuck behind a wall of financial faithlessness. And Jesus is asking you to risk, to trust him, to get out of the boat and follow. For someone else, getting out of the boat may mean simply being crazy generous in a way that your family and friends go, are you nuts? You see, here's the truth. I don't know how Jesus wants you to get out of the boat. I just know that, like Peter, he's standing there saying, it's me. Come on. And we got to decide, are we going to be faith heroes and follow Jesus? Or are we going to doubt? 
I'm praying that you get out of the boat, that you follow Jesus and you see his miraculous power happen in your life. Because I believe that everyone in this room can be that hero of faith.